Koto Katoa, warm Pacific greetings from the University of Auckland. It's a privilege to be invited to give this keynote at Leeds. As some of you will know, I've spent seven years at Leeds before leaving the UK for Australia and New Zealand. I reflect back fondly on those years, which were some of the most productive years of my academic career. It's also a privilege because of what this summit is about. It is about the ambition on the part of the university, the ambition to forge a new way in a fast evolving world. And it reaches deep into the soul of the university. It's about its purpose, its responsibilities, and importantly, its place in society. Now I'll return to the creation of the Knowledge Equity Network shortly. But first, I'd like to discuss our purpose and how we realize that purpose in today's world. For me, context is a critical starting point. If we strip away all that a university does with its teaching, learning, research, partnering and civic duties, knowledge is the common factor. Universities create and share knowledge. This is not an exclusive role for universities, of course. Yet universities are unique in their centuries-old commitment to the public good and in being the critic and conscience of society. We must never lose sight of this. For most of us here today, we would say that addressing inequality has been a primary driver for the careers we have chosen in higher education. As researchers and educationalists, we've been focused on inequality in our communities, in our countries, and globally. Our research, no matter the nature of that research, is about improving lives, be that directly through education and health, or indirectly through knowledge that supports the environment, the oceans, our lands, the climate, or the economy. Inequality has been with us all our working lives. It's global and it's getting worse. Yet in the words of a recently released International Science Council report, inequality remains a pervasive disease. And the report continues that it is a disease that has grown in recent years in all societies, and it's worsened, of course, with the pandemic. Worsened with minorities, worsened with women and youth bearing a disproportionate burden within countries. The International Science Council report titled Unprecedented and Unfinished, COVID-19 and Implications for National and Global Policy was released earlier this year. The president of the council and the lead author is my University of Auckland Waipapa Tomatero colleague, Professor Sir Peter Gluckman. The report speaks to this summit and its focus on inequality. Further, it is a sharp reminder that in 2022, for higher education and research to be relevant to its communities, globally and to its funders, it must engage those communities. The Council report calls for a real commitment to the Sustainable Development Goals 2030 Agenda to secure greater societal resilience and equity. As you all know, the SDGs originated at the UN Conference on Sustainable Development in Rio de Janeiro. That was in 2012. The objective then was to produce a set of universal goals that meet the urgent environmental, political and economic challenges facing our world. Those haven't changed. The 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development is a bold commitment to finish what was started with the Millennium Development Goals an urgent call to shift the world onto a more sustainable path. And it is our commitment, not a UN commitment, for 193 countries signed the agenda. Our countries are committed to the SDG goals and our institutions have embedded the SDG impact targets across our research, teaching and learning. Over the last decade, we can all attest to the great SDG strides and achievements in our communities and across the world. Considerable progress has been made in eradicating the most extreme poverty, for example. Yet, great inequality remains and is again growing. We've witnessed this through the pandemic, both within nations and between nations. The pandemic saw nations work together but the global response also highlighted failings in our multilateral system. The gulf between the global north and south remains pronounced. 
And what we've learned is that without addressing inequality, our global response to the pandemic was flawed. And as such, future crises will be equally flawed or worse. I mentioned earlier the geopolitical environment we now live in. Economists refer to a rupture in our global economic and political system. The global economy is fragmenting along political lines. The International Science Council believes inequalities are the most critical social vector facing the world. It is also the most critical issue facing us and our institutions. At home, we have our direct responses to this. So now I step from the global to the local, and I want to take you to Aotearoa, New Zealand, where we have our unique responses to inequality. Each country, of course, finds its own way to respond to inequality. So briefly, I'll sketch for you an insight into our world. At the University of Auckland, Waipapata Mataro in the South Pacific, we have dedicated support programmes and scholarships for our Māori and Pacific minorities and underprivileged students. And we're confronting the lack of diversity amongst our research workforce. Māori make up only 5% of our researchers, and it's a major issue that's not easily addressed. Yet for our research into inequality in our communities to be effective, our researchers must come from those communities. Our commitment to equality in our research workforce is shared by the New Zealand government. Programmes have been developed to tackle low participation and retention rates among Māori researchers. This commitment reaches beyond our indigenous communities though. As the largest university in the South Pacific, we must also ensure our research system equally establishes critical roles for Pacific research and Pacific researchers. Small as our Māori research workforce is, significant progress has been made on Māori data sovereignty, recognising that Māori data should be subject to Māori governance. At the University of Auckland, we have recently appointed a leader to guide and further embed Māori data sovereignty principles but these actions alone are not enough. Alongside greater equity, diversity, inclusion and data principles, there's a push for decolonisation. Aotearoa New Zealand is now taking a systemic approach to decolonisation. This means that separate government agencies are taking a distinct government approach to policy and system change, which reflects Indigenous Māori values. The university is reviewing its systems through a decolonisation lens itself. This begins with our new strategy, To Matatete. It calls out the university's fundamental principles which reflect our foundational relationship with Tangata Whenua, in other words, local Māori, and our commitment to the treaty, the Treaty to Treaty, the Treaty of Watangi, signed by the indigenous Māori people and the British Crown in 1840. In relation to research, there's a growing commitment to creating a research ecosystem that reflects Aotearoa's unique opportunities and challenges. The government is currently reviewing the entire research science and innovation ecosystem with a commitment to embed the treaty to treaty across the design and delivery attributes of the system. This will enable opportunities for Mataranga Māori, the indigenous Māori knowledge system, and importantly, there's a widespread recognition that this must marry a commitment to Maturanga Māori with an understanding that research is a global undertaking and the importance of collaborating with the best knowledge systems in the world. Our university is committed to both. We believe that it is only by genuinely meeting these obligations that our university and our research can drive transformational change change in the lives of Māori and Pacific peoples both within Aotearoa New Zealand and beyond. Partnerships and collaborations have long been a signature of universities. We are natural collaborators and we seek out peers. And now more than ever, the significance of what we are as a collective cannot be underplayed. The world is confronting global issues, including inequality, fighting the pandemic, addressing climate change and sustainable development. There can only be global solutions. So now more than ever, greater international cooperation is required. We will hunt down those solutions through that cooperation and improve lives. 
The world needs us to do that. It needs strong alliances and we can provide them. The International Science Council in its report highlights the importance of information sharing and the aims of the open science movement to make the scientific process more transparent. It is also important that it's inclusive and democratic, but that costs. The report singles out a growing concern that low-income countries, less wealthy universities and young scientists or those from minority communities are discriminated against in the current approach to open science. And it's here that I turn to our summit and the Knowledge Equity Network. The formation of the network is a response to the issues I have just mentioned and it comes at a time of intense discussion within higher education about the need for universities to transform in response to our changing environment and to the expectations of our communities and society. I bring a perspective from a society and a university that are indigenising. Our university is transforming. And one could argue that this transformation has been underway for decades. For it was in the 1960s that one of my predecessors, Sir Colin Maiden, witnessed firsthand the marginalisation and the disenfranchisement of Native Americans, African Americans and Hispanic communities on US campuses. He realised that something must be done at our campus in order to respond to the marginalisation of Māori. Eventually, a Whānui Māori meeting house was built. This is a powerful physical statement on the campus. It's a safe place for Māori staff and students to inhabit. Today, the government sets targets for Māori Pacific and disabled student recruitment and graduates. As mentioned in 2020, the university confirmed a new vision and strategy, Tomata Tete. This name can be interpreted from Tereo Māori as pursuing excellence despite uncertainty. It recognises the exciting challenges posed by the concerns of our age and is a contemporary statement of our purpose, vision and values. Our fundamental principles reflect our foundational relationship with Tangata Whenua, particularly the local tribe, Ngāti Whātua Oraki, the people of the land. This is the land where the university is centred and where the treaty was signed with the Crown in 1840. With the vision came a new name for the university gifted by Ngāti Whātua Oraki. The name is Waipapa Tomata Ro. You've already heard me talk about it today. It recognises the physical features of our location. And in applying the vision, we've set our core equity principles for our institution. The university recognises the importance of and is committed to Tariti of Waitangi, in particularly Māori ways of doing and being equal to all others. We recognise and are committed to the sacred ba, or special relationship between Māori and Pacific peoples, by virtue of shared whakapapa, or ancestry, as well as commonalities in origins, histories and culture. And we're committed to the establishment of respectful relationships. Within our agreed responsibilities, we agree to strive to dismantle barriers and forms of privilege that denigrate manner and perpetuate inequalities. And we seek to enable all members of our university community and those seeking to join it to experience equitable access, equitable participation and success. The university community is expected to create an environment and avenues for learning that embrace the Māori world. Mataranga Māori, the Māori knowledge system, Kopapa Māori, the Māori way, the treaty, and our Pacific context and connections. Now this may all seem a long way from your summit and ambition to form a knowledge equity network. But I say awareness of these powerful forces of change in another part of the world, Aotearoa New Zealand for example, is critical for the success of your network. I mentioned our Māori research community earlier Many of these researchers work within and bring into the university Mataranga Māori, an indigenous knowledge system. We see multiple knowledge systems working alongside each other at the university. 
And whilst this has not been without controversy, it has served to remind us all that our traditional Western knowledge system is not the only knowledge system, that it's not superior, and we must be open to a multitude of knowledge systems. Having read the Declaration on the Knowledge Equity Network, I'm impressed with its endeavours and its ambition. We know that universities are reservoirs of knowledge, and for centuries we've held this knowledge close. In a way, we've protected it. The Knowledge Equity Network wants to change that. It wants to send knowledge out into the world, around the world, openly, collaboratively and free of charge. You are challenging universities and higher education institutions to commit to actions that support the global goal of at least 75% of published educational material being offered freely and openly to educators, students and self-learners by 2030. Awesome. At the same time, you're challenging higher education institutions to support the global goal of at least 90% of new research outputs being transparent and freely accessible by 2030. Well, I have some challenges for you to consider as you refine your network declaration. Firstly, if universities want to openly send their knowledge out into the world, what about letting knowledge into their world? I'm thinking of the knowledge generated by alternative knowledge systems and by the cultures and experience of those historically excluded from Western higher education. Colonised cultures, people with constrained economic or refugee backgrounds, people with disability and those at the margins of our societies. I would encourage you to truly examine what an open culture for higher education is. Surely an open higher education culture must be willing to receive knowledge that it is not familiar with. Otherwise, it perpetuates an elitism of holding the treasures and exercising largesse when healthy cultures are based on respect for others. A second challenge. What does it mean to offer knowledge freely? I agree with the principle, of course, but nothing comes for free. Someone meets the cost somewhere. We must think about who bears the cost of publishing. Is it the researcher, many of whom have limited funds? This means there are risks in the quality of the knowledge offered for free. Will it be consistently quality knowledge? Or will it be offered freely by interested parties and agendas? Biased, in other words. We must be vigilant in ensuring open access is not corrupted. Your declaration also calls for a move away from competition focused rankings and a competitive environment to a global collaborative endeavour where partnership is celebrated and rewarded. I would say to you that the two are not mutually exclusive. We already see university rankings agencies developing new rankings which measure sustainable development goal impacts. They also measure sustainability and partnerships. Universities have evolved a unique system that is collaborative and competitive at the same time. It's what drives us. And I acknowledge that in recent times competition has dominated many, some of whom in the pursuit of winning, have lost sight of their purpose. We need to correct this craziness. Yet we must not turn our backs on competition. It's a powerful force for good, if directed properly. Condemning rankings, you limit your friends. Colleagues, I welcome you to your summit today and to the dialogue and to the content that it will generate. I mentioned earlier that we're all driven by the urgent need to respond to inequality. We agree that responses must be global, but we must also explore what those responses are. And there are many. Knowledge equity is a critical response. Tenakoto katoa na mihinui, wishing you all well for your summit. Kia kaha, stay strong.